thanks for uh, giving me a few minutes of your time. So uh, this morning I was at a meeting with some state legislators and uh, they were talking quite a bit about some uh, federal legislation that's been talked about today and how angry it's making them that, and how much distrust it's causing them to feel about the federal government. And then I was having some conversations back and forth about that and I was walking in to the office before I came here and I was thinking, you know, we've had a lot of stuff go on in the state of Michigan with the Detroit Public Schools and with the Flint Water issue. So I might say that I have a lot of uh, distrust in Lansing right now. And then I'm thinking about you as students and the things that I do as a superintendent and the decisions that I try to make. And I wonder if I do the same kinds of things to you. You know, I wonder if you look at what we're trying to do as a school system and how we're trying to get kids to think and if you if you sometimes think well I don't have a lot of trust in what these people are doing they don't even know who I am or understand my perspective so uh, I'm really interested in your perspectives and I'm gonna ask you to do some talking to each other and give me some feedback and uh, talk to you about some things that I'm thinking of so the first thing I'd like to ask you to do is uh, talk to somebody next to you about uh, what is your passion and uh, how did you find your passion. So you could talk to this woman. Okay. Okay. Could a couple people share with me what is your passion? How do you find? How did you find it? Yes. Um, my passion is dance, and I want to be dance since I was three years old. Okay. And I ended up not liking it, so I quit for two years, and I came back and been dancing ever since. So it's something you really love. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Somebody else? Yes. I love photography, and I got into it since my mom has been a photographer ever since I was born. And I've been surrounded by art my whole life, so I kind of yeah. just picked it up in seventh grade. Environment. <laughs> my dad's a photographer too, but I'm not. I don't have an artistic eye, I don't think. Yes. I'm actually for I'm, Can you say? Oh, okay. Okay. So each of these are things that you've been involved with with your parents. Started at a young age. Okay. The next question I'd like to ask you is: Will you talk to somebody about? The person who's been most influential to you in your 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 life. Thank <laughs> you. 
people share? Who's been most influential? Yes. Probably my mom. How so? Uh, she, I feel like she's just a really genuine, nice person. Okay. Thank you very much. Were you gonna? Yeah, I was going to say my father because uh, when I was a young kid, he had a really bad accident. So he always okay. just taught me how life is really fragile and you have to cherish it and work really hard at making your life worth living. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Yes. Um, both my dads, they kind of um, really make most of the actions of the way that I'm like, process information. So I'm hearing a lot about these sort of the way that you view the world and the way you treat other people have been influenced by these people. That's really interesting to me. So, uh, Another question I have, uh, this is the mission statement for the Clarkson Community Schools. What does that mean to you? Please talk to somebody next year. What, what do you think that means? What does it mean to you? They don't want us to be the program. They want to be able to do it. So it's like a small show. That's not what I'm talking about. What does that mean to you? Yes. You think it's stereotypical? Yeah. Okay. Fair. How how so? It's thinking about like changing the world, which is something that every teenager will often say. Okay. So it's not it doesn't mean so much to you then you just see it as a stereotypical kind of a you can see that anywhere? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. I think it means that we're like supposed to be on the path towards becoming our own people and being functioning as society. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes. Well we're kinda of talking about how we think that it's supposed to not just be facts and memorization. But that it also means that there has to be a want for that, and it's very um, dependent upon variables like the teachers and the students that you have. They have to want to think like that and not just to memorize. Have the motivation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Can I ask you to read this statement? And or the
uh, you can agree or disagree, or what, what, is, what do you think? This is from a researcher out of the University of Pennsylvania. His name is Scott Barry Kaufman, and he's, uh, he's written these two books, Ungifted and Wired to Create. So he looks a lot at giftedness and uh, intelligence, things like that. So what do you guys, what do you think? What do you agree with or disagree with? Why? Yes. career readiness and uh, that's kind of been you got you know you guys take the SAT or the ACT they give us a, a ranking of what percentage of students are college and career ready based upon uh, how you did on that test and then how that predicts your grades in college and it's something like only 20% of Michigan students maybe a little bit less than that something like 18% that the tests say uh, that uh, kids are college and career ready and when I look at that statistic, I say, that cannot be possible. How can you give a test to, to thousands of students, hundreds of thousands of kids, and say that 80% of them are not ready for college? That that's like, seems like statistically, there must be something wrong with the assessment if it says that 80% of people are like not where they should be. So um, my, quest, my next question for you is, what do you think are the most important skills and dispositions uh, that, what do you think are, your, are required of, of high school graduates, college graduates? What do you think are the most important skills and the most important dispositions, ways of thinking? What do you think are most important in our world? 
So if you could talk to somebody next to you about that. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I think it's important for kids graduating high school to understand that they need to start taking care of themselves and fending for themselves. Okay. Take a little bit of personal responsibility when making that jump to college. Okay. So these communication skills and this these uh, ownership. Okay. Yes. You need to understand yourself. Okay. Like my parents they both switched majors like two times in college and they didn't understand themselves or how they would learn. Didn't know what they wanted yet. Okay, so we want ownership, communication, and an understanding of yourself. Yes. Yes. Time management is okay. definitely a big one as far as being able to function and do what you need to do. Time management is very important. Thank you. Yes. you put into it and I've heard quite a bit of research about that too that the kids who do are most uh, you know that only like 75% of people in Michigan have a college education something like that I know it's higher in Oakland County but so it's, there are a lot of people who start college and don't finish and, it, and the research says that uh, the more involved you are like in clubs and you know advocating for yourself getting involved with tutoring Lots, the more involved you are, the more likely you are to matriculate and finish. So um, I wanted to share, I really, I thank you for your perspectives. I didn't hear anybody say, I, I know, I didn't hear anybody say like calculus <laughs> or like uh, knowing your math facts. Uh, I know those are important things. I'm not saying they're not important, but I didn't, I didn't hear anybody say that. So the things that I'm hearing you talk about, they really can't. We don't measure on tests currently, and probably you don't get a lot of feedback on it. Do you get feedback like on your uh, communication? You probably do on communication, right? Mm -hmm. On stick to it, I guess. Uh, 
terms of ownership, things like that. So uh, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago with this. I was at a uh, design firm over in Walt Lake, and their, this is an industrial design firm. And they started what's called the Michigan Design Council. And they met with the governor, and they, Michigan's like the number one in the country for industrial designers. And so they're designed like trains and autonomous vehicles, uh, hockey gloves. They've been in business for 80 years. And it's set up kind of like a Google space where you know they have these cubicles, but they're low and their people are really collaborative. And, uh, and you walk all through their shop and they've got uh, their mission statement and they talk about people, some of the things that you've said, wanting them to be creative and innovative. And, uh, and then they have a sign that says, uh, different by design, and they have all their, uh, or several things that they've designed. And then you walk in the back and they've got a shop. So uh, it's, it's like a maker space. And they've got all these band saws and, and they've got uh, 3D printers. And they said they want for their uh, engineers to be able to go out into this shop and make stuff. They want to make prototypes. They don't want just people who know their you know, engineering kinds of things. They want them to be able to make stuff. And they said that they think that every uh, school in Michigan should have a maker space. They want people, the kids, to put their hands on things and, and know how to use these tools. And uh, it's interesting to me that they have this design council that's wanting to make Michigan number one in design and attract more people to our state, yet our school systems are measuring uh, not necessarily the things that are about innovation and creativity. So I'm gonna try to have a meeting with them coming up. They, they're having a meeting over at Chrysler and they said that I could come. And I'm gonna ask them some of the same questions that I'm asking you about the skills and dispositions they think kids need and then what we can do as educators to try to uh, help um, build those skills. So. Uh, these are some more thoughts that I'd like you to talk about. Um, we have some particular, in my opinion, some particular definitions of intelligence and talent and uh, uh, potential, intelligence, talent, and potential. So I'd like to just ask you to think about these things a little bit. What do you think it means to be smart? What is intelligence? Could you talk to somebody next to you about that? shouldn't 
uh, tell kids that you're proud of them. This is just one perspective because then they they think about um, that's something that they're trying to live up to your standards or things like that. Instead, you should say, you know, make statements about that was really a great effort or that must make you feel really good about yourself. That must make you really happy, those kinds of things. And I've tried to do that with my own children, my own two girls. I know they have different perspectives, but I'm just thinking about I don't want them to just think they, they live according to my values or the things that I believe in. I want them to develop their own. So I appreciate that statement. What else do you think about talent or intelligence? Yes. I think that both of them kind of relate uh, to how many work people are willing to do. Okay. To learn that skill, but I don't necessarily know if everyone thinks of it that way. People just count and know you're good at it because you're just naturally good at it. They don't see it. Okay, so the nature nurture thing? Okay, thank you. Another thought? Yes. I guess like all of those things that talent is like you can be good at anything. Like if you can be good at anything, you can be good at anything. Like if you feel like you're not good at anything, but then you try something else and it's you know, you're pretty good at that, like talent really has no boundaries. Like someone could have a very nice, like a really, really good talent in one thing and then be terrible at another thing and then another thing could be the exact opposite. Like it has no real Okay. Something was hard to find. All right, so uh, Scott Barry Kaufman makes this statement that talent is a passion for ability to master the rules of the domain. So I'm thinking about this and how we're assessing kids in Michigan and in our country and how we think about children and how we think about intelligence. And so uh, this statement really means a lot to me. If we, I'm wondering what the world, how the world might be different if we thought about talent in this way. So if you have that passion, if you have that proclivity, something I heard you talk about uh, your, your passion in, in horse, with horses and with dance and different things that have been influenced since you were very young. And uh, I know probably each one of you, just like this young lady was saying in the back, you probably have something that you just absolutely love to do and nobody has to tell you to go do it. Like nobody has to say, go play the piano if you love playing the piano or go Go ride your horse. Nobody has to tell you that. They might have to say, hey, you got to come in now and you have to eat and you have to drink some water and don't forget to go to the bathroom, that kind of thing. You kind of get lost in your passion. And I think about motivation. Like sometimes we say kids aren't motivated in school. Some kids are more motivated than others. But then those same kids can go home and like spend 15 hours on their computer. So you must be motivated somehow. Maybe it's we need to pay attention to your passions and try to help you uh, explore those in order for us to really see where your motivation is. It's not, I, I always, I think you shouldn't have to give a kid a cookie to learn. You know, it should be something that if you really love to learn, just do it. So this is an interesting way to think about it. And then this is uh, what he says about intelligence. He talks about engagement and abilities in the pursuit of personal goals only by viewing what people are able and willing to do when motivated can we grasp some of intelligence. So we really have to observe what kids love to do and observe them in their passions in order to figure out how they're smart. And rather than if they're smart, thinking about how kids are smart, how each of us is intelligent. And then some of what I heard you say engagement and ability to feed off each other. So in our state, there's this uh, whole thing about schools of choice. And um, there's a charter school movement. It's a huge movement in our state. There are like half the kids in Detroit go to charter schools. And there are charter schools that can open like through a university or through, uh, through a school system. And they have some different rules that they follow. So a school could open up just like it. Pontiac has most of their students go to charter schools or go to other school districts. There are, there are only like uh, maybe 4,000 kids left in the Pontiac schools, something like that. And they used to, there might be like 8,000 or so who actually live there, but they go lots of different places. And so uh, we have a lot of choice in Michigan. And I wonder if what we should have instead of choice is 
opportunity. Like instead of equitable choice, if we should have equitable opportunities for kids. So if there's something that you love, if you love horseback riding, or you love dancing, or you love uh, computer programming, you should have equitable opportunities to pursue and learn about the things that you're passionate about. Equitable opportunities. Just like we give kids opportunities for uh, like IB, advanced placement, CSM tech. Uh, we should have equal opportunities for kids who are in, uh, one, who love to well, or who love the arts, or things like that. How can we give kids equitable opportunities in our uh, country? How could we equalize opportunities? No matter where you live, you have the same opportunity to pursue or develop your passions. Uh, and then this is from Tony Wagner, and he talks about how we start out when we're young playing, and a lot of uh, the stuff I read says kids don't play as much as they used to. We're, we're, we do a lot of structured things. Like you might, when I was young, you know, we used to go out and play in the woods and climb trees. And maybe, I don't know how much you guys get to do that. Where you, do you get to do that? Do you, have, you get to play? When you were a kid, did you get, or we always, like at soccer practice, or was everything structured? <laughs> So there's lots of research that says, that says kids have to play when they're young. If you don't play, you don't develop these social skills, these emotional skills. You don't learn to collaborate. You get uh, more and more stress. You don't have coping skills. So I worry about like stress and anxiety in our children, and uh, you know what the pressures of school, the pressures of life might do to kids, and how that would affect our us as a society long term, like the unintended consequences. So uh, when, we, when we're able to play, then we can develop our passions and those can turn into pursuits in our lives. Okay. So I already talked about that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the Detroit Public Schools. Mr. Isley, what time do I, am I supposed to be done? You have about 15 minutes. Okay. So, did you know that the Detroit Public Schools are like 715, uh, are like three and a half billion dollars in debt, something like that? Mm -hmm. Did you know about that? Some of you big, huge number. And that the state of Michigan is negotiating and how to bail them out. And most of the money is owed to the state for pensions, the way I understand it. So it's the state that's really gonna pay itself. And if that money's not paid back to the state, that it has a tremendous negative effect on uh, the whole state. So bankruptcy is not really an option. So there's this whole debate going on between uh, the Great Lakes Education Projects, which is a, a charter school movement in the state, and it's funded by the DeVos family, who uh, they are behind. Uh, they made billions of dollars with Amway over in Grand Rapids, and they. Uh, want charter schools, they want lots of choice in our state, and they don't want the regulation of charter schools. So they want to be able to go into Detroit public schools, and if Detroit's going to get this money, they want to be able to say there won't be a teacher's union, that they won't have like uh, pensions, that there'll be uh, alternative pathways for teachers like Teach for America. You don't necessarily have to have a teaching certificate in order to teach there. Uh, they want to do this A, B, C, D, E grading of schools so that they can do this comparability. And uh, they want all these rules attached to the money. So there's big money out of the Grand Rapids area from the DeVos family and this Great Lakes Education Project to have these kind of uh, policies put in place in order for Detroit to have this money. And then you've got the mayor of Detroit down here, Mayor Duggins, who wants local control. He wants mayoral control, I should say. He wants to be able to regulate the schools, regulate the charter schools and uh, have a lot of say in that. So you have his, his interest from the mayor, and then you've got, there's another group that's not up here, but uh, they want local control, so they want a school board. They, they don't like the emergency managers, like the things that have happened in Flint and in Detroit, and they see that as the problem, so they want to take it back to local control. And then you've got the House of Representatives and the Senate who have some different perspectives. So, uh, one of them wants to get, they want to break it up into two different school districts. They want to have one school district that oversees the, uh, like the education 
and then they want to have another school district that oversees the debt, so paying off this, these billions of dollars. And uh, part of, so there's $715 million that between all of this they want to give over the next 10 years, I think, out of tobacco settlement money. And uh, so they're going to take money out of the school aid fund, technically, because uh, all of your parents and everybody who lives, uh, there are 18 mills that operate the school districts locally. I shouldn't say your parents. People pay property taxes, and those, that money is used to fund the schools locally. And then the state gives us money also to, to uh, based upon your 2% sales tax. So that's how schools are funded, both locally and from state money. And if you don't give money locally, if you just use that money to pay the debt, then it's going to cost at least $50 per student for everybody in the state in order to bail out the truck. So that means that Clarkson schools will get $50 less at least for every single student so that Detroit can be bailed out. So we have 8,000 students times 50. How much is that? So every year we have that much less money for our educated Clarkson students so that the Detroit public schools can be can continue to operate. Okay, so there are lots of interests in Detroit in terms of what's going to be decided. And uh, Detroit has the most kids of any city in the, in the United States who live in poverty. Something like 56% of kids in Detroit are, are live in poverty. And uh, when you live in poverty, there's uh, a lot of factors in your life, like uh, your parents are not going to probably read to you as much as if you were in a middle class home. Uh, they're not going to uh, nurture you, maybe not hold you as much. There's going to there's possibility of there's a lot of stress in your house, a lot of anxiety. You know where's the next meal coming from? You're worried about a lot of things, and so your brain doesn't develop at the same way of like a, a someone who lives in a middle class home. And there's tremendous stress and anxiety. So kids who live in poverty or who grow up in a lot of stress, their brains actually look different than kids who have a lot of nurturing and caring and are uh, rich environment. So when I think about the $715 million that's going, that they want to give to Detroit, there's a lot of political discussion between these five or six entities. And I wonder who's talking about the kids. You know, who's talking about the way that the kids in Detroit actually live their lives, the stress that they're under, the anxiety they're under. And I can't help but think that if, if, my, if your teachers were like calling in sick to the point where school has to shut down and there's all this national news about your school system, that has to, to me, add more stress and anxiety to what's going on. It's not like you can ignore that. So. I, I wonder who's thinking about these kids, and if we're going to spend $715 million, how is it going to make their lives better? How is it going to help these kids who are living in poverty? And if we don't do something to help these kids, then all this money is just, I don't see how it's going to do any good in the long term. How do we address kids who uh, live in these kinds of environments where their brains look like they came from a war zone, like they've been, you know, in, in, in a foreign country fighting in a war and they've come home, like post-traumatic stress syndrome. What do we do for these kids? And so uh, I talked to these researchers over at Western Michigan University, and they have this childhood trauma center where they go in and they do these assessments on young kids. They might be as young as two years old, and maybe they've been in a home where something really traumatic has happened. Uh, maybe there was a loss of a loved one. Uh, maybe there's physical abuse or sexual abuse. And then they, they're trying to talk to these kids. And instead of uh, looking at kids who are misbehaving and saying, what's wrong with that kid? Why is that, you know, we look at a kid maybe in the grocery store or in church or somewhere and they're misbehaving and you say, what is wrong with that kid? Why can't they sit still? And these researchers are saying what we need to, to do instead is say, is ask what, what happened to that child? What's that child's story? And we can't really help the child unless we know 
what's gone on in his or her life that causes him or her to act that way. So there's a lot of research right now about the brain and about learning and uh, trauma and how kids learn. And uh, I'm trying to have some discussions with people in our state. We wrote a, a free press letter to the editor about uh, who's paying attention to the kids. So this is something I'm thinking a lot about. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. <clears throat> Gotta talk louder, bud. Louder. Can't hear you at all. Uh, I think that when it comes a lot to economics, people aren't necessarily thinking about the kids that much. You gotta get into that point where their money is going, not necessarily what people are getting out of that money. Okay. Thank you. I think I've like these allergies so half my head is fucked up. Let's get back. Thank you. What else? What other thoughts? Any other thoughts? Yes. Continue operating. So, what do they do with all those kids? Or where do you go to school? That's a big, huge question. It's like 50,000 students have to go to other districts or charter schools. Tim Pontian, last year or the year before, like shut down like a month early. They Probably. There have been a couple districts in our state who closed early because they didn't have enough money to operate through the whole school year. So, they were saying they were going to have to shut down in April if they didn't get some money from the state. So that's a really great question, what would happen if they do, if they can't continue? Yes? Is this purely on the state level, level or does it also extend to the federal level? It's mainly Michigan, it's mainly Detroit who's having this. I mean, there are big cities like Philadelphia you hear about who also have, it's, it seems like uh, the Detroit thing is fairly unique in certain ways, but there are big city schools who are struggling. A lot of it has to do with enrollment. You know, our state is losing population. So I was just with the Walled Lake superintendent this morning, Farmington, uh, uh, Huron Valley, they're losing lots and lots of kids. So the whole state is losing population. So that's, yes. I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit to connect to conforming and not conforming before we go. Um, I think it'd be good for the kids to hear from you on a personal level. You know, you're, okay. to say the least, a non-conformist in education. You've been at the forefront of doing things differently uh -huh. um, in Michigan. What drives you to be that way in the face of a lot of pressure for people to succumb to the standardized tests uh, for the sake of money or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of pressure I know um, from outside forces that it's easy to just do things the way they've normally done. As a non-conformist in this particular situation, what do you think drives you to, to kind of fly in the face of conformity in this situation? Uh, I, I have this really deep-seated passion in myself to do the best I can for kids, no matter where they are, and I feel really fortunate to be superintendent of Clarkston. And so I want for each one of you to have your dreams come true and for us to do whatever we can as a school system to make sure that you have 
whatever it takes to be able to pursue your dreams. I don't want ever, ever anyone to tell you what you can't do or what your limits are. Uh, I want for people to respect teachers, for our country to respect teachers and to uh, let them make decisions about kids. And I don't believe that standardized tests uh, allow us to have a good picture of what kids can actually do. I think it's very limiting. And uh, what some of these researchers say is that uh, uh, standardization is the enemy of creativity. So if we want creative and innovative kids and we can't just give them all the same test and compare them to each other all the time. So this is like my passion in life is to do whatever I can for children. And uh, this is how I spend a lot of my time talking to legislators, reading, writing, uh, as much as I can learn to try to, uh, and I don't want anybody to tell me no, you can't do that. So uh, I've learned that throughout my life. Like when you work for other people, they might, you never wanna go to them and say, give them something that they can tell you no, you can't do that. I just want them to say, uh, because I'm not gonna quit. You know, I'm not gonna stop if something I believe in. I will not, I won't, I won't quit trying. I'm gonna find another way if it's something I really truly believe in. So this is like the drive and passion I have in my life and I uh, I'm just feel fortunate to be able to live the life that I do and do what I love every day. It's not like I ever have to kick myself to get out of bed, you know, or uh, force myself to be here, so. Any thanks. general questions for Dr. Rock before we end today? All right, thank you, Dr. Rock. Thank you.